Okay. So today I'm talking to you about Whispers of the Wild, which is the business that I've started in South Africa. And I'll talk to you about some of the challenges of starting a business, some of the problems that I faced, and some of the problems that I want to overcome. And since we're talking about solutions, I'm going to talk to you about the solutions that I hope my business will have. So I guess the first question and the best place to start is why did I become an entrepreneur? Because I'm actually an ecologist and a conservationist by training. I did my master's in conservation ecology. And I finished that uh, just at the end of last year. And I, but before that, I've also worked as, as a safari guide. And I've had a lot of experience traveling through protected areas, working, and studying. And that put me in kind of a, a unique position to look at protected areas and realize that, in fact, in the nature-based tourism industry, there's not that much innovation going on. There's not a lot of new products, new services coming out. And that allowed me to identify these niches that weren't being filled. Because a lot, what tends to happen is you have, you have a large, you have a few things that they, they offer, but there's nothing really new and really exciting out there. But the challenge that I faced was, is a challenge that I think a lot of conservationists face. And that's that business is not seen as like a viable career option for conservationists, you know, especially young ones. It's, it's, it's seen as being somewhat at loggerheads. Business and conservation are seen as being somewhat at loggerheads. And profit is a bit of a dirty word in, conserv in some conservation fields. So when I got back, I, w I was looking at jobs and looking at, at sort of academia as a, as a potential career path. But I had all of these ideas and I, I realized that if I wasn't going to do them, probably someone, would, someone else would do them and they wouldn't do them as well. So I decided, <laughs> at least I hope so. Uh, and basically, I think that young conservationists need to be encouraged to get into business. Because I think if, if you have more conservation entrepreneurs, they can actually build in those, those ethics and those principles of conservation that are, are so ingrained in them. They, they can build those into their business models. And I'll give you an example by talking about my visions and my aims. So, Whispers of the Wild, I, aim, I hope, will become a leader in alternative ecotourism experiences. And that, that idea of alternative eco ecotourism experiences comes from this, 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 this idea that yeah, these niches aren't being filled. And I, I think there are a lot of new and exciting ways that you can, that you could experience nature. And I want to, I want to find those and, and develop them. But more than that, I, I hope that Whispers of the Wild will be profitable because it is a business and I'm not ashamed of that. And I think that it's important because obviously protected areas, parks, they need to be uh, economically competitive. And the best way to do that is to start to diversify the product offerings that, that they have. Um, but on top of that, I hope that Whispers of the Wild will contribute to environmental awareness and education and make a significant contribution to conservation. And those are, that's built into the business. Those are two of the fundamental pillars of, my, of the business. And those things have guided me from, from the point where I first started putting my ideas to paper. So what were the problems? We're here to talk about solutions, so you have to have a problem first. So what were the problems that I, that I saw and that I hope to solve through my business? And the first is that there are significant barriers between visitors to parks and information about the wilderness that they see. And the first is cost. So I know from talking to people that come from sort of relatively poor um, communities around reserves or talking to my, when I was a student, sort of going to reserves as a poor student, or just talking to your average sort of middle class family that visits a reserve. A lot of these people would go to reserves, they would see the animals, and they'd kind of show they'd be like, oh, that's very pretty, and then drive by and never actually learn anything about them. Because going, getting a guide and going on a guided game drive is actually really expensive. And that means that this guided safari experience has become the domain of the elite. And very few people that don't have the money to afford that actually get that information. Now there are other avenues open if you want to learn about those. And that's, you could open a book and read about them, or there are apps out there that where you can read about them. But a lot of people are not willing to make the effort. You know, they're not willing to see an animal and then go back, spend 20 minutes reading about it. And this is a huge problem because 
I mean, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a saying which is one of my favorite sayings, which is, uh, you will not protect what you do not love, and you will not love what you do not know. And a secondary problem, or not a secondary, but a second problem, is how do you get urban youth to connect with nature? Now, I'm sure, I mean, obviously our lives are now increasingly being uh, revolving around screens. And I'm sure a few of you will sort of take your phone out and check your phones as, as you're going. And I mean, this is, this is the back again, 2005 and 2013. That just shows screens are everywhere. And at, at times we are, we're, uh, we are interacting with two or three screens at any given time. And that's quite fundamental because computers, tablets, and smartphones, they're not just changing the way, it's, it's not saying sort of, it's, it's actually very profound. It changes the way we, we think and interact with each other and interact with our environments. And one of the ways it's changed us is that there's this need from, for continuous entertainment. You know, if you think about in the past, if you were watching TV and an advert came on, you would sit there and watch the adverts. Now, the advert comes on, you pull your phone out, you check your messages, you go on your computer, you check Facebook quickly, you check your emails. There's this need to, be, to constantly have information kind of thrown at us. And I think the youth in particular, because they are actually growing up with that, they find it very difficult to, to, to detach themselves from their devices. So, and that's a problem for, nat for natural areas, because obviously nature works at a different rhythm to the fast-paced world that we live in. And a lot, of a lot of the time, I've seen this with family, friends, with, with people that I've interacted with, kids go out to, to protected areas, and they go through 20 minutes, half an hour without seeing anything, they get bored, then they start to complain, then, and that has an influence on their parents because their parents say, okay, we can't, we can't keep them entertained for the whole game drive or for, for the whole sort of weekend in the bush. So they stop going to the bush and they find other places where kids will be more entertained. So we have to start thinking about how can we integrate these technologies into the wilderness experience. But that brings another problem because you don't want te technology to just be thrown into the wilderness willy-nilly. You want to do it intelligent because I'm sure there's a lot of purists at this at this event who feel that having technology there in the wilderness experience is it's a bit of an invasion, you know. And by having something that's reminding them of the city, reminding them of the, of the emails that they have to check, it, it, it kind of ruins the sense of place for them. But as I just described, it's kind of an, ine an inevitability that this technology is going to make its way into protected areas. So we as conservationists have to take this, we have to own it, and we have to do it intelligently so that we don't ruin the wilderness experience and we don't cheapen it. So that was something that was really quite fundamental for me. And in developing my business, I developed a principle that guided me throughout the whole process. And that was, let nature be the star. So use technology in an intelligent, in an intelligent way so that you are augmenting the experience, your, your natural experience, and not taking people's attention away from it. So what were the solutions that I came up with? The first is that I decided that it, an app was the ideal way to get that sort of information out there. And this is because smartphone use has exploded across Africa, and it's, it's growing every day. And it's amazing because you'll go to some little town in the middle of Botswana, and you'll see people that have their, their Blackberries or whatever, and they, they're using them, and they're using them to send messages and communicate and go on the internet and download music. And it's actually revolutionizing the way they communicate and service delivery throughout Africa. So everything from banks to hospitals are using these to communicate with people. And then of course young people are incre increasingly relating to the world through apps. So if you ask a young person, okay, what's the weather going to be like? They're going to get an app out there. How do you get from A to B? They're going to get an app out there. What's the price? They're going to check the price here compared to the price in the rest of the world. They apps are being used for everything. So for me, this was the perfect medium to integ integrate this technology into parks and to include the people that I wanted to, to include. And then I had to think, okay, what is this app going to have? And I decided that audio, an audio guide to the safari experience is probably the best way to do this. And the reason for it is that it's very, audio is very easily accessible. So it doesn't require you to read. And what's beautiful about it is, a lot, is it allows you to learn about animals as you're looking at them, and you don't have to take your eyes off that. And it's something that you kind of take for granted, because think about it, we all, 
we all listen to radio all the time while we're driving and all that time we're, we're able to take in this information through our ears while we're looking at the world around us and audio can be very entertaining and very informative i'm not sure if any of you have used an audio guide before but basically it can make things like inanimate objects or it can make them come to life and give them a story and i think that that could be a very powerful thing to add to wildlife and of course nature remains a star you're still looking at nature you're still interacting with nature it's just that you're learning about it at the same time so what does the app include obviously i wish that a lot of people have said oh it would be good if you could take a photo and then uh, it identifies the animal for you i wish that kind of technology was readily available but it's not so um, basically there's little ways to help people identify what they're looking at then there's beautiful pictures of the animal to, to again to ident help people identify there's basic information, written information, which will include information on their red, the red list status, the, the threats to that animal, distribution maps, tracks, and then you've got, you break the audio down into, into tracks, sort of one minute tracks, and each of them are thematically arranged so that you can sort of, you, you can uh, focus in on what you're looking at. So if you see a male, two male baboons fighting, you can see, oh, there's a track here about male baboons, click on that and in that you're likely to find information that relates to what you're seeing in front of you and if you notice down in the bottom there that little hard thing is a donate to conservation button so that's aimed to basically capture those positive positive emotions that people feel when they're there when they're there seeing nature so you just come from america your favorite animal in the world is an elephant you see an elephant and you're feeling this incredibly these incredibly strong emotions and then you can click that button and that'll take you to a donation page where you can donate to a recognized conservation organization. And then we've got, I've developed a game which also is meant to help you stay engaged in the game drive experience, keep you looking out for different animals. And all of it, like I said, was designed with this idea of uh, keeping nature as the star. So I've just put together a little video, I hope that it works. And this shows sort of the difference between the experience with and without the audio guy. So these are wild dogs. Their tails too are an amazing communication tool. While their coat patterns are as unique as fingerprints, every single painted dog has a white tail. When greeting, they point them up in excitement. When relaxed, the tail hangs low. When showing aggression, they will stiffen. And when submissive, they will curl it between their legs. If you see a painted dog pack, watch their tails and see if you can work out what they are saying to each other. Okay, but in conclusion, it's, it may be a little bit premature to talk about um, solutions because I actually haven't launched the app yet. I'm hoping to launch in the next month or so. But I do really believe that if you have a good business model that's underlined by sound principles, sound principles of conservation or sound humanitarian principles, you can really create a successful business, but at the same time benefit humans and nature. And I think that that's something that I, that's a belief that I really, uh, that I really truly hold. And remember, let nature be the star. Thank you.